Hey, uh, welcome back everybody uh, from the break. I hope you had a good time. Uh, got some water, coffee, tea. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Welcome back. Right, um, so let's just continue from where we left off, right? Um, the act of worship that uh, that woman uh, displayed was just beautiful. Uh, it's just a beautiful, beautiful act of worship, which will be remembered through the ages uh, to come as well. Okay. Um, so now when we uh, just, let's take a look at the notes, page 25 in our notes. There's a few pointers there. It says, worshipers are givers Okay, worshippers are givers. The expensive perfume cost about a year's wages. It represented women's entire savings, and we spoke about that. Right? Um, and then the second point is, brokenness and tears are true key elements in worship. The women's weeping was an outward manifestation of a heart that was deeply stirred before the Lord. Right, it deeply stirred before the Lord, which it, we don't know how badly she was weeping. Uh, it's just as weeping, so we can Im we can either imagine that it's just a few tears rolling down, or she must have just been wailing and groaning, uh, you know, uh, as she was as she was doing this, was crying uncontrollably. Right, um, I'm not sure if any one of has, uh, uh, you know, if if you've been in a place where you've actually weeped or cried out you know, without any control, right? Uh, when we've uh, lost some of our loved ones, you've seen uh, people, you know, just cry and weep out of control, isn't it? So I am imagining that it's not just a gentle tear that's coming, you know, or what we say, crocodile tears. <laughs> that's not the, that's not what's happening there. Uh, I'd like to imagine that she's just wailing her heart out, uh, pouring her heart out, you know, just crying uh, and weeping. So that's what's happening there. Um, and uh, the third point in our notes is uh, the Greek word uh, proskunio means to kiss the hand towards. That's another word for worship, right? Proskunio means to kiss the hand towards, to, uh, to a reverence or you're paying a homage uh, by kissing the hand, uh, to bow to oneself, uh, to bow one's self in adoration. So uh that, that that's another scene that is happening there is that this woman uh, is just pouring out her adoration and all her devotion on Jesus and point 4 there an act of worship may attract attention or defamation from others when david danced before the lord michael despised him in her heart you know that True worship sometimes will invoke the criticism of the spiritually barren, but real worshipers are willing to pay the price. Okay, we learned this in chapter one uh, of the course is that if we are not the recipient of worship, uh, it's not up to us to judge uh, a person who's worshiping at, at whatever capacity that they are worshiping in. Right. Uh, if we, we are not the recipients, so we shouldn't be, uh, you know, judging others uh, act of worship. So let, let, let it be what they do. It's what it is. Um, I, I'm actually reminded of this <clears throat> incredible story of uh, a very well-known preacher. And if I name that preacher, you we will all probably know him. Uh, he was at a conference, uh, you know, and towards the end, people were getting prayed. And one of the women got prayed and uh she was laughing out of joy uncontrollably, like laughing for a long time, right? Uh, and then he thought to himself, this preacher thought to himself, okay, she's a little weird and crazy, uh, you know? And, uh, and so this is person next to the preacher. She leans towards the preacher and she tells him, do you know that she was a prostitute for 27 years? Today's the day she got delivered and free. Uh, I mean, a very good reason for us to not judge another person's worship would be we, we 
we don't know the battles every individual is facing. We will never know, isn't it? Uh, we will never know the battle the other person is fighting or whatnot. We will never know what most of the times what the other person is celebrating for. Right. Um, so we need to be careful with that. Amen. Um, so true worship may attract attention or defamation, just like what she did. She did not care. Like, you know, she walked right past through the group of people. But her eyes was on the one thing, right? That was Jesus. She, she only cared about him. She did not. She could not care less about anybody else whose house it was. Pharisee's house, you know, no, she put her reputation on the line like she did not have any reputation. Her reputation was negative, uh, but she put all, all, all down, surrendered everything, and she just went for it. She just went for it because she saw that Jesus was worth it. Amen. Uh, finally, in page 25, uh, at the bottom, the disciples had much head knowledge about worship having sat at the feet of Jesus for so long, but it took a sinful woman who did not know the theology to emulate being a worshiper before those disciples. Spiritual maturity does not exempt one from being a worshiper. Okay, I think we need to read that line again. <laughs> Spiritual maturity does not exempt one from being a worshiper. In truth, there should be a greater responsibility on the elders and spiritually mature to worship the Lord and to be examples of worship to others. Pastors and church leaders must respond to their divine duty of leading the saints to responsiveness in worship by setting an example. By setting an example. Amen. Um, Sorry, that's, what's the point? <laughs> it's just one strange thing that happened just now. Alexa Sorry, responded. To what's me. The Yo. Excuse me, guys. This is very embarrassing. What do I do with that? No. <laughs> Alexa just responded to me. If you are laughing. <laughs> Oh boy, this is like only the second time that's happened. Okay, so, and both the times it's happened when I was just sharing, and most of the time it doesn't recognize what I say. It gives me wrong answers. But <laughs> oh dear, what a way to conclude this series session, huh? Okay, <laughs> okay, uh, let's just move on. Um, I. I hope everybody uh, could take away something from the chapter, right? Um, and, you know, and just just as a footnote, okay. Uh, if we were talking about uh, Rahab and Tamar, uh, did you know that Rahab is mentioned in uh, Hebrews chapter eleven, in the chapter of faith? She's considered to be uh, one of the heroes of faith. Right? That's amazing. Uh, Please be careful not to put any personal reminders during this time. Yes, Divya, I will not. Yeah, I don't put any reminders also. Too out of nowhere, it's just fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, imagine I did that. Personal reminders. Gosh. <sighs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Good. Uh, are, are, you, are you all learning something? I hope that there was something that you could take away from the last session. Yeah. Yes, everybody doing all right? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. All right, guys. Uh, so now let's move on to uh, the next chapter, chapter seven. It is, but before just we do that, does anybody have any questions, or uh, is there anything that you want to sh share? About? Okay. 
Thanks, dear. Okay. If there are no questions, uh, we'll go on. All right. Um, chapter seven, um, page twenty-six in your notes is all about uh, talks about entering the presence of God. Okay, entering the presence of God. Um, It starts off by saying uh, the different, manif uh, different manifestations of the presence of God. Point one being uh, God is omnipresent. Uh, his presence is everywhere all the time. Um, you know, Matthew 18, 20 says where two or three are gathered, he, uh, in his name, he is there. Okay, that is the omnipresence. Uh, and then in point three, the second Chronicles 5, chapter 13 and 14, talks about the cloud of glory filling Solomon's temple and the singers and the musicians lifted their hearts in praise. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about the presence of God, what is the first thing? What, are, what is the one of the most important thing that, that uh, comes to your mind when we talk about the presence of God? What does the presence of God mean to you? Come on, guys. I'm mean, coming down on that. Okay. Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. All the strange stuff has to happen today. Okay. Right, heaven coming down to earth. Uh, it's a privilege to be in his presence. Right, yeah, uh, presence uh, of God. When we say that, uh, what does it mean to you? But that, that is the question. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Can I share? Yes, Divya, yes. Yeah, suddenly I, uh, I was reminded of Psalms 8, where it says, uh, like, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him so uh the presence of god you know that is so much full of love and purity and you know uh, just wants to be with us sinners yeah so that's uh i i can't even comprehend the depth of his love right. to do that to just be mindful of my nitty-gritty you know details of life yeah thank you Thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Rosalyn, anybody else? Subhu, Priya, uh, what do you think about uh, what's the first thing that stands out when you think about the presence of God? Nikki, Ripika, anybody? John, anything else besides heaven coming down to earth? It's a good now. Um, I think, <clears throat> as uh, Divya was mentioning, it's it's more like a facility where we get to meet with the King of Kings, and hmm. uh, when we call upon His name, He comes down with His power uh, by all His grace, not even considering. Uh, what has happened in our life, but he manifests in his power. Um, and just as we discussed before, with while he heaven coming down to earth, like with all the angels worshipping him, the experience that we get to realize when we see the face of God. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Priya shares, uh, when I think about God's presence, it's me pouring myself to him. It's tears for me. Right. Okay. So Tolly says, communion with him. Okay. Presence of God is where we become one with God. Okay. Right. Awesome. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, it, it's very dangerous for us as Christians to become very overly familiar with terms like this, isn't it? Uh, I mean, we use it all the time, you know, when if you're leading worship or in churches, you know, his presence is here. Let's welcome the presence of God in our midst. I mean, we are saying the truth, you know, and we say that with all honesty and, you know, genuineness. But what I'm only trying to say is that it's we have to be very careful because we use that phrase uh, so often in, in you know, in, in our Christian circle, isn't it? Uh, you know, his presence is here. Uh, let's welcome the presence of the Lord. Uh, and there's so many songs about his presence, um, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and when we just want to take things slow and just look at those words individually, when we look at the presence, just the presence, it's, it simply means it, it, that something is present, something or someone, it's present. It's, it's there with us, right? In, uh, in your presence, right? It's there. And now when we look at the presence of God, it needs to add some weight, isn't it? That means the maker of the universe, right? The Alpha and the Omega, the Father of Light, the Ancient of Days, from everlasting to everlasting, He is God. Right? I mean, you see, read in Isaiah, He says, okay, look up to the heavens. Who created all of these? The one who just parted the Red Sea with the blast of His nostrils. The one who sustains the universe, Isaiah again says, in the span of his hands, like about there, the entire universe is like right there. He is present. Right? Uh, and uh, one of the first examples there in point one is God is omnipresence. It means his presence is everywhere, all the time. It's a class, it's so easy for us to understand in this context because we are all. Uh, from different places. Uh, we started off today's session by, you know, I was asking a couple of them, where are they from? Uh, you know, from which town, which city are they from? So we are, we are connecting on this call from different places, geographically, physically. And to know that he is there, he is with you right there. It's amazing, isn't it? That he's present. So he is omnipresent. But then there are times where he manifests, he shows himself more tangibly, right? Um, now, I mean, if you've, you know, if you've, if you've had siblings uh, at home, I mean, you know how it was, okay? Me and my sister, we were scared of my dad. I mean, if he was at home, we would behave differently. If he was not at home, we would behave differently. Okay, how many of you guys have been there? <laughs> okay. Uh, so when he was at home, even though we were in our room and he was in a different room, all of us. Yeah. We know that he's present. His presence is there. And then, so if we make some noise or whatever, you know, do something that we were not supposed to do, <laughs> it's a very different feeling when he shows himself up in our room, isn't it? Then we know we are in trouble types. Uh, you know, it's, it's a similar situation uh, wherever we are, you know, for let's say we are in a cafe, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a very well-known person, you know, a celebrity, whoever, right? who's in the same cafe, who's having a coffee in a different table, but you also happen to be there having coffee. So you know the presence is that you are aware of the person's presence. But the atmosphere changes when that person or that celebrity walks towards you and stands in front of you and says like, hey, how are you? Isn't it? Right? So, and... And, and as the scripture says, right, in Second Chronicles 5.13, like in the, as it's mentioned in the notes, it says the cloud of glory is filling Solomon's temple, right? The cloud of glory. So that is, simply means the Shekinah glory, which means the weight. There's a weightiness 
to his presence. It's very tangible, right? It's a cloud of heaviness, of weight that would come and fill. So, um, and so we need to understand this, isn't it? Um, so he's present everywhere, and there are times that he shows himself up. And towards the end of this session, hopefully, I uh, will put across, uh, you know, one key at least in how we can walk in the manifest presence of God in our lives. Okay, um, let, let's move on. Um, the second point there talks about our approach towards this God's presence. How do we approach this presence of God? Uh, you know, this mighty one, this lofty one, the holy one of Israel. Uh, there, There's... We need to approach with the reverence, isn't it? So and that's what the points there states. Okay, we approach the presence of God it can either be through praise or through worship. Okay, um, just to uh, share some of the scriptures that's mentioned there for us is um, Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Enter his gates, approach. Right? Uh, Psalm 95, verse 2 says, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with a song of praise. Psalm 42 verse 4 says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the strong and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise and multitude keeping festivals. And uh, let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 29. Isaiah chapter 30. Let me paste it uh, in the chat section. I'll do that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that uh, scripture. Isaiah 30, 29 says, You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept, and gladness of heart as when one set out, sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. And finally, this is one last scripture, Isaiah 35, 10 says, And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness with, and joy and sorrow, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Okay, so the, those are just some of the key scriptures, not the only ones. Uh, some of the script, scriptures talking about entering his presence, approaching the presence of God with praise, with song, with shouts of joy, with, uh, with gladness, right? With, with musical instruments. Uh, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Amen. Um, and the other one, as mentioned, is through worship. First Chronicles 16, 29, it says... Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering. Okay? Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Okay? Bring an offering and come before him. Uh, in the previous chapter, chapter 6, we read about, I mean, we learned about the difference between spiritual worship and fleshly worship. And under spiritual worship, we see that God has called us to be his royal priesthood. Isn't it? Yes. Um, I hope I'm not going too fast. But in, under spiritual worship, we learn that God calls us his royal priesthood. Now, one of the important things that we need to know is that the priests never went before God empty-handed. They never went before him empty-handed. And so now, as we are called his royal priesthood, we need to know that we are ministers, uh, uh, we are ministering unto the Lord in his presence. And now, we, of course, we don't have an offering. What we go before him is with everything that we have, with our hearts completely surrendered to him. So we cannot go into his presence with, uh, you know, without offering, without willing to offer up our hearts and sur in surrender to him. And then other scriptures, let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes, actually. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says, um, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth. 
nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Okay. Um, one, one more scripture and we will kind of move on. This uh, is one last scripture, guys. I'm sorry for reading a, a lot of scriptures. Uh, Psalm 132, verse 7. Psalm 132, verse 7, it says, Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Okay, let, us let us go to his dwelling place and let us worship at his footstool. A dwelling place is his tabernacle. That's where God lives. That's where he dwells, right? Um, so our approach to God's presence can either be through praise and through worship. And so we've learned in detail about you know, praise and worship in chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. All right. Um, so it goes on to say in the notes that there is uh, no formula, there is no right or wrong way. It's only God's way. Right? Uh, it may be different every time. A worship leader must have a deeper prayer life and must cultivate sensitivity to the spirit of God in order to discern the way of God for each service. Okay, and I think that point just kind of highlights uh, about us becoming over familiar with the way God works, right? Okay, this is how he moved yesterday, so that's how he's going to move today, right? Uh, and if you remember, one of the definitions uh, of worship, um, not worship, we started off was uh, by this person who says, every definition is dangerous. Um, and, you know, putting worship into a box is dangerous. And, you know, putting God inside a box is very, very dangerous, saying this is how he will move, you know, every Sunday or every day in our, in our lives. It can be very tricky. So being sensitive to the spirit of God, leaning in to listen, right? Leaning in to listen to what he has to say um, is very important. So, you know, our prayers should be, uh, if we are leading worship or in general, is let me say what you want me to say. Let me sing what you want me to sing. Let me speak what you want me to speak, um, right? is would be a good reminder for, of, you know, for, for us to be on the right track. Okay, so I hope you guys are with me so far. Um, and then the third section of this chapter goes on to say the responsibility of ministering unto the Lord is the responsibility of every worshiper. Right? A responsibility of ministering unto the Lord is a responsibility of every worshiper. Why? Because we are all uh, we are all a royal priesthood now, okay? It's not just your pastor, uh, you know, your worship leader or your worship pastor uh, who is a priest and who is called to, uh, you know, who is not some high priest. He's the only one who has access to the presence of the Lord, to the throne of grace. No, it's all of us. We are his royal priesthood. Therefore, it is all of our responsibility as well to minister unto the Lord. That was... The priest had two primary responsibilities. His first primary priority was to minister unto him, minister unto the Lord. And the second priority was to minister unto the people. So our first priority as priests is to minister unto the Lord first, develop that communion with him, that intimacy with him. And out of the abundance of that, your ministry towards people should flow. Amen. Uh, so we prepare ourselves uh, for worship with prayer, with word and confession. We invest energy. Uh, we, we need to be self-motivated in our praise and worship. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Like intrinsic motivation, as they call it. You know? We worship despite distractions. We worship all week long. Um, so that is a call of a worshiper. And it's so much in line with us developing, uh, living, becoming a worshiper. Right? Um, another reminder for, from the second point of the third section, it says, we prepare ourselves with worship, with prayer, word, and confession. It's interesting that it doesn't talk about guitars or drums or learning the songs. Uh, you know, 
It says prayer, you prepare for worship with prayer, word, and confession. And, um, you know, the word of God is so important. Yes or no? <laughs> right? Uh, you know, in this day and age, in this generation, um, as I've mentioned, you know, the topic and the subject of worship uh, has become so popular, uh, you know, you don't really need to, there's so much of teaching on worship, rightly so. And, uh, you know, the people, the, the percentage of people telling that I'm passionate about worship than prayer has increased in the last 15 to 20 years. And, and I want to just remind us of the importance of the word of God, okay? David, as we all know, was a passionate worshiper. And if, if we cannot talk about worship on the subject of worship and not talk about David, isn't it? And so, um, you know, and in 2 Samuel, uh, I can, I'm not sure if I've shared this with you, but if I have, please forgive me. So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see, uh, you know, David is now, uh, you know, the king of Israel and Judah, right? He's, he's, been, he's been anointed as king. Saul is gone. David defeats the Philistines. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we see one of the first thing that David does is to go and bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Israel. What he's doing is he's going to, you know, bring the presence of God because the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol that the presence of God was with Israel, right? Now, David is fully passionate. Now, he is the king now. He's fully passionate about bringing the presence of God back into Israel. And he's doing the right thing. He's just very passionate. But we all know what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, verse 6. It says, when they, when they came to the threshing floor of Nekon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. Right? So it tells us that the ark of the covenant was placed on a cart. Right? Are you guys with me? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so the oxen stumbled and Uzzah kind of reached out and he dies. Okay, the actual word there is uh, he exploded. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. But, uh, but why am I trying to point this out is, so David has become king. Okay, he's a passionate worshiper. He has full passion for the presence of God and as a worshiper. And he wants to bring the presence of God back into Israel. Now, approximately about 400 and 430 years prior to this, okay, God tells something in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, Please go with me to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 17. De Deuteronomy chapter 17. Okay, Tell me when you're there. So it's important. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 17. <clears throat> right? Okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to read for us from verse 14. Okay, just bear with me. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 onwards. Once again, remember this is about 400, let's say 400 years before Second Samuel chapter 6. Okay? <clears throat> it says, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. So, the word of knowledge that God is giving Prophetic is um, it's amazing. I mean, he's God. He knows everything. But to give something, this instruction like this, he knew that 400 years from now that Israel is going to ask a king. 
So he says, when you will ask a king, okay, he's not saying you might or, you know, he says, you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king, the Lord your God chooses. Okay, here we go. He must be from among your own brothers. Do not place a foreigner over you. One who is not a uh, one who is not a brother Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself, or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back. You are not to go back that way again. Verse seventeen. He must not take many wives, for his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large num amounts of silver and gold. Verse 18. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the priests who are Levites. It is to be with him and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to river the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and, the dec and these decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Okay, so God is instructing. He's giving us this command saying that, okay, when you eventually get a king, this is what the king is supposed to do. I mean, apart from having jewelry, gold and wives and whatnot, one of the key things God tells us, the king is to make a copy of the law, that is the word of God, and keep with him. And he is to read it day and night, meditate on it, and more sometimes even read it in the presence of the priests. Now, something tells me that David did not do that. Had he done that, he would know from the law that it, the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be carried by the Levites. Isn't it? And then David learns that from, you know, after you know, he goes back, after Uzzah dies, he's angry with himself. He's angry that this happened. And then he goes back and he learns, he reads the word, he studies the word and says, okay, the Ark of the, Go Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to be put on an oxen or a cart. It's supposed to be carried by men who are Levites, who are from the tribe of Levites. And so this is just to emphasize the importance of just word of God. If David had done that, maybe Uzzah would have been alive. You know, he didn't have to die. The responsibility of a king, royalty. And now in the new covenant, we are royal priesthood. With that comes the importance of us giving importance to the word of God as well, isn't it, guys? We can't just say, you know, I'm passionate about worship, worship, worship. Oh, I love worship, 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 and not say I don't like the word of God. Amen. And so let the story of David be an important, uh, you know, uh, remember, uh, reminder for us that in, in this journey of worship, as you as we become worshiper, we cannot forget the word of God. Amen. Your love for his word has to keep increasing. And finally, in this chapter, it ends at the bottom with the sacrifice of praise. In Hebrews 13, 15, we've looked at that verse uh, many times talks about the fruit of your lips, which is the sacrifice of praise. And First Peter chapter two verse five again, you know, talks about how uh, we are brought into the royal priesthood of priests through Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, can we just? Uh, are you guys okay to read a couple more scriptures, or you all? Like, okay, this is too many scriptures for today. <laughs> it, I would, I mean, I would just want you all to encourage and go back home and read the scriptures that's mentioned in the sacrifice of praise there, right? Uh, and so, all, all of this is in subject of this chapter that's talking about entering the presence of God, right? And the last section is talking about the sacrifice of praise. Right, so there is a sacrifice that's involved in worship uh, and in praise.
um, and uh, but and I'm just setting the tone before we go into the next chapter where we will talk about the tabernacle of Moses. Before a first sacrifice was made, right? Before any sacrifice was made, there's a scripture that says uh, obedience is better than sacrifice, isn't it? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so one of the first things that God accepted, uh, expected of a mankind was obedience. You know, uh, we see in Genesis chapter 2, um, Genesis chapter 2, I think, um, uh, verse 11, I think, I'm finding hard to... Okay, um, Genesis chapter 2, some, one verse, it says, The Lord commanded them not to eat. Uh, they can eat from every other fruit except for that certain fruit. And then coming down to chapter 3, verse 11, we see that, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So there is obedience associated with the, law, the commandment of the Lord. Right? And then in the same chapter, when we come, Genesis chapter 3, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife uh, and clothed them. So God made his own first sacrifice, and out of which he made to the skin and clothed them. So before sacrifice, what was expected was obedience. Right? And and that is and it was and that was the only difference between them, Adam and Eve being in paradise and not being in paradise. I mean, paradise as in the Garden of Eden, that's the reference. And so, uh, okay, uh, I promise, just one last scripture, okay? Uh, let's, let's go to Exodus chapter 40. Apologize, guys. Exodus chapter 40. Okay, I'm not going to read the entire scripture, uh, entire chapter. Okay, that chapter starts off by saying, then the Lord said to Moses. Okay, the Lord said to Moses. And there's a set of instruction. Uh, look at, let's go to verse 16. Okay, Exodus 40 verse 16. It says, Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Are you with me? Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Let's come down to verse 19. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. Verse 20. 21. I'm sorry. Verse 20. It says, he took the testimony and placed it in the ark. Verse 21. The last part. It says, as the Lord commanded him. And so, if you read that chapter all the way down to verse 33, all the way down to verse 33, it says, Moses did everything as the Lord commanded him. That means Moses obeyed everything what the Lord commanded him to do. Just as we saw in the Garden of Eden, first God, tells, God commanded them not to eat from the fruit. And then they break that, you know, uh, they break that commandment and hence sacrifice comes in. And, but then looking at this chapter, it says, Moses did everything that the Lord commanded. And then verse 34, pay attention. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The manifestation of his presence is happening in that place. And so I want us to, I want to leave us with this one thought today. Uh, entering the presence of God beyond the sacrifice anything that you can we can offer and bring before him when we walk in obedience you will walk in the manifest presence of god all our lives amen um so i want to encourage us all with that word uh and leave us with that word today uh thank you all for being very patient um
Okay, let's just uh, pray and we'll close. Okay. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to learn from your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that your everything that we heard will bear fruit in our lives. Help us to be extravagant worshipers, Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us to see the worth, the worthiness of Jesus, Lord. I thank you for everything you are doing in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen, guys. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining in.